Welcome to Interviews with Innocence, a podcast about spirituality, consciousness, and exploring the wisdom our children bring into this world. I believe that our very young children are our greatest teachers. After all, they're the masters of living in the present moment, bubbling in unconditional love, enjoying the messiness of life, and curious about the universe in all its dimensions. The pure essence that young children exhibit lives within all of us. My hope is that these interviews will help us discover, embrace, and connect with the sacred core of childhood that resides within each of our hearts. I am your host, Marla Hughes. And as promised today, I will continue reading The War Diaries. March 29th. 2022, day 34. This is a quote by James Hillman. For the good of society, should cosmetic facelifts be prohibited? Are they a crime against humanity? What you do to your visible image has societal implications. Your face is the other for everyone else. If it no longer bears its essential vulnerability, then the grounds for caring, the demand for honesty, the call to respond on which societal cohesion rests have lost their originating source. James Hellman, The Force of Character. The call to respond. There is no one here whose face has been cosmetically altered. Visible on each one is the disturbance and the surprise of war. Their vulnerability exposed. There is no filter. In one sentence, I can tell you that Daria's husband is now here with us, and she, she hoof, though I will not be able to say how he managed or by what means. When he came to my room last night, the face of relief greeted me. A mixture of relief, gratitude, disbelief, wonder was all at once discernible. Daria, on the other hand, had only one distinguishing emotion cursing through her entire body, and that was the overwhelming presence of joy. The human spirit, its will, had prevailed over death and destruction and war, at least in this story. Earlier in the day, Y came running up to Paul looking for a ride to Warsaw, her tear-stained face unmistakably anxious. She wants to run, vests, and protective gear to the other side of the border. This is a frequent activity from what I understand, but I have no idea the risks involved. What I do know is the um, impulse to do such a thing is driven by desperation and fear. Not everyone will survive this war which means that at some future celebration, some wedding, some baptism, some Easter Sunday morning, a family member will be noticeably missing. There will be more graves and more grief and more tears with each passing day. How do we know the fate of all the brothers, fathers, uncles, and husbands related to the women here? The likelihood that one of these women will be left widowed with a fatherless child is highly probable. Thus, why does what she can. In a moment of helplessness and despair, she runs military supplies to those she can. Ernest's blood pressure has been running high since she ran out of medicine. She waited to tell us and then had to go to the doctor yesterday morning. I wish she had come earlier to us, but at least it's been resolved for the time being. The call to respond. Without one word spoken, through hand gestures and a look of disquiet, her need for help was conveyed. Before bedtime, Marina came knocking at the door to our room. She was visibly agitated. Something was wrong with Daniel, her five-year-old boy. He had a high temperature and she had no medicine. Paul leapt into into action, grabbed the children's acetaminophen and joined her at her quarters. I jumped into the car to warm it up because she was insistent on going to the hospital. But after another 20 minutes, his temperature was going down, even though Paul said Marina was a mess and that every move the child made, she would jump up and hover hover over him. Paul was finally successful in convincing her that the medicine would work 
and with the rest, he should be fine. Even Daniel said, Mama, please let me sleep. I just want to sleep. From what I understand, it was a sleepless night for Marina, but Daniel is feeling better this morning. The call to respond. Marina's husband has had brain surgery three times. The neurological damage has left him with a face that doesn't ever change expression. I can't imagine what it's like to be in this situation with two children, one sick and a husband who is limited and unable to make decisions. Everyone is looking for work. It's the topic of discussion at the table. It's a look of apprehension on everyone's face. We are developing a work program here, but it takes time. We are looking to provide one that will make integration for our residents as seamless as possible. Ideally, a work-study program whereby one can also learn the language and then leave with references when the time comes to do so. It's very important because there is already an emerging resentment among the locals where our residents are concerned. The Ukrainians are offered free public transportation. In my own home, there's the occasional raised eyebrow because I buy good jam for the table. Today, one of the women who work here declared how much work there was. And when I asked what could I do to lessen or redistribute duties, she suggested I put the residents to work without pay, of course. I asked what she would have them do. They already clean their own rooms and bathrooms. They cook for themselves and they clean up the kitchen afterwards. They rake leaves and are altogether most helpful. Did she have a particular idea in mind? The windows, she blurted out. The windows, I mused. We do the windows only twice a year. It's quite a job and we usually hire others to help. So we do. Besides, she muttered, it's going to rain tomorrow. I'm growing in my faith in a way I never saw coming. I am learning to actually trust. I am learning a deeper patience. I have lowered my expectations to a level that allows me to be more open-hearted with those who cannot. War Diaries, April 7th, 2022. Diana has been born. Mother and baby are doing well, but because of virus restrictions still in place, Igor was not allowed into the birthing room. He waited here at she Hoof like one who waits at a mobile phone park for an arriving flight full of anticipation and excitement. I saw him only minutes after the news and he could hardly form a sentence. He was so overjoyed. Another interesting detail about Igor is he shares our last name, Kinwitz, except with the Ukrainian spelling. Paul's uncle was Poland's national historian after the wall, after the war. Stefan Kienwitz and his son Janik followed in his footsteps. So naturally, Paul called him to see if there was a possible chance that this might be a distant relative. As Janik explains it, there was a branch of the Kienwitz who split off from those in the Kresy, where Paul's father's side of the family was from, in the 19th century and migrated to what is now the Ukraine. The Kresy, or what is more commonly known as the borderlands, was the eastern part of the Second Polish Republic during the interwar period, located in what is now Belarus. I have thus designated myself Siasia Amber, which delights me to no end. The busload of arrivals from Saturday have decided to stay. The children seem to be settling in, and they can receive the medical attention they need in Stas Jet Zal. Paul has already accompanied one of the children and her mother to see the doctor. I can report good results from this first visit. We have a new baby and a new puppy, Bear, also called Misha by the residents, because it means teddy bear in Russian. Bear is a hulking presence that started showing up at Shihuf. And the reason I'm calling it Sishao and Shihuf now is because Paul told me that that is the correct pronunciation. So I just wanted to make sure I got that right. A couple of weeks ago, I had no idea that the children here had already discovered him and were very sad that he appeared to have no home. 
There were nights when it was cold and raining and he whimpered under the windows of a few who heard him. I hadn't the first notion of any of this. Not long after, though, I saw him myself loping across the lawn. One of the workers here said he belonged to a villager, but when I inquired further, it turned out he had been abandoned. Paul wasn't thrilled to acquire another dog, as we have two plus the cat, but Bear was particularly persuasive when it came to taking up residence at sea at Shehoof. Jordan and I finally took him to the vet, where we were quite surprised to learn he was near death's door, and he's barely a year old. The next few days, we spent hours in the office holding him while they gave him fluids, medicines, and injections. After his treatment on the third day, we came home to wait and see. It was a tense weekend because he wasn't eating much at first, and when he finally did devour a whole bowlful, he collapsed in lethargy. I went to bed crying because I really thought we were going to lose him. But the next morning, Jordan texted to say he was bounding with energy. Bear now belongs at Shehoof. He is a permanent resident. Bear belongs. As humans, we long to belong, don't we? I can't believe it's much different for a dog who once traveled in a wolf pack. It was where he belonged. My world is enlarging to include Bear and a new family of residents whose families were split apart, severed from everything they knew, everything that was familiar, but fortunately, not everything they loved. Yesterday, Andrei showed, up, showed us his artwork. A few days after his arrival here, he pulled a USB stick from his pocket and said, my whole life's work is here on this stick. Everything else is lost. Andrei is an illustrator and designs book covers for a living. He has also written several books on the technique of drawing the human body, landscapes, and famous architectural landmarks. I asked him yesterday if he had ever taught at the university. No, he said, I'm a practical artist. He works primarily in pencil, though we did see some paintings. There were a series of detective stories he illustrated, and on the cover of one was a very handsome young man. This is his son, he said. I can only conclude that he is still in the Ukraine fighting against occupation. When I woke up this morning to get coffee, Andrei was in the kitchen. I wanted to tell him how he and the presence of his family have changed my life, have forced me to look deeply into what it means to be human, to suffer, but also to rejoice. How I value life in a way I never imagined possible. I am so sorry they are here under these circumstances, but that we are and that we manage is what is exceptional about be being human. I am learning the great lesson of not taking myself so seriously, of recognizing my own smallness and self-centeredness. When Andre laughs, he is really laughing. He laughs from his gut. He laughs with abandon. Our days here together are dedicated to each other. We form a community of human beings. On Saturday, we are heading for another field trip, this time to Krakow. Plus, the work study program has begun. It's spring here at Shehoof, and all is in bloom. Seeds are being sown in the greenhouse. Trees are beginning to leaf. The small white wildflowers are visible as far as the eye can see. We are not now able to employ several women thanks to the generous donations of our global friends. There's still yet so much to tell you about the soul of Shehoof and how the broken find relief here. I will think about this on the bus ride to Krakow. War Diaries, April 11th, 2022, day 47. I have come to the conclusion to, that to ask the question, why are there those who are capable of such egregious acts against their fellow man is the wrong question to ask because this question has no answer. Nor can one answer why another human being can bring himself to commit outright murder 
More specifically, commit genocide against an entire community based on nothing more than a simple willingness to do so. The wrong, wrong question in this instance has no answer. Myth, mythologically imparable through story, rhyme, song, and tell only, are we able to make sense of human cruelty? In the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus said, the Father's kingdom is like a person who had good seed. His enemy came at night and sowed weeds among the seed. The person did not let them pull up the weeds, but said to them, no, or you might go to pull up the weeds and pull up the wheat along with them. For on the day of the harvest, the weeds will be conspicuous and will be pulled up and burned. Theologically, Father's kingdom, as it is written in this parable, would indicate the world of matter and not paradise or the world of spirit, as it might otherwise be understood in speaking of such a kingdom. In God's world, then, there is evil. In the world of matter, the enemy comes at night to sow the weeds. There is the act of evil and the concept of evil. An example of the act of evil is the intentional destruction of a place, including its inhabitants. The concept of evil is how we come to terms with this act. Most of our residents took the day trip to Krakow on Saturday. We left the bus and walked across the road together into the town square. There we decided to identify the restaurant before splitting off into smaller groups for sightseeing. As we were approaching the restaurant location, I noticed a man talking to one of the women in our group. I walked over to him and asked him if he spoke English. He did. Did I ask him if he knew her? No, he did not. This is when I knew he was a predator, at which point my voice became very angry and confrontational, asking why he was talking to her as he had no business doing so. To which he replied, I'm opening a new firm in Casamarez. Oh, I bet you are, I said. I am looking for Ukrainians. Oh, I bet you are, I repeated. Then I told him firmly to get the hell away from our group and to leave us alone. He wanted to give her his email address, and I said, no, give it to me. I will take it. He was bold enough to ask who I was, to which I replied, none of your damn business. He gave me an email address, which of course was fake, weeds among us. Our cousin met us at the restaurant, and when I told her the story, she said there were reports of kidnappings in broad daylight. Yesterday, Paul sent me an article about teenagers traveling alone from the Ukraine into London who are being lured into the sex trade. Weeds among us. Max is leaving us today because he was able to get a Canadian passport. He still has to get it stamped before he can go, but can't get through the throngs of people in Warsaw who literally sleep outside the embassy waiting for the chance to be at the front of the line when the doors do open. Every time he has tried, there are about 500 people stacked on top of each other, waiting to be called. It's impossible at the moment to get what he needs here in Poland, but there is a chance he might fare better in Rome. So he is heading there. Max is Igor's good friend. We are standing in the coffee area this morning saying goodbye. I couldn't help myself. I started to cry, and then I said to the boys, please forgive me, but I can't stop the tears today. I just simply can't. When I think to the extent to which an individual can formulate sophisticated schemes of corruption, exploitation, manipulation, lies, and harm specifically designed to bring injury against another is not something I know had externally process. The other day, I heard that one of the stores here in Stazau fired two of their Polish employees with the express purpose of hiring two Ukrainians because they get a sizable benefit from doing so. All of these stories swirl around inside of me as I'm saying goodbye to Max, apologizing for the tears. Our guests welcomed the opportunity to talk about what they were feeling too. 
Eager said that before the war, he thought about a new car, his job, holidays, buying jewelry for his wife, going out with friends. Nothing special, he said. But now all seems meaningless as all he thinks about now is life. Is his wife healthy? The baby? Are they out of harm's way? When he hears a car backfire, he jumps because he will always hear the bombs dropping, the sound of gunfire. Max does not want to go, not really. Yes, he recognizes the good fortune of having contacts and resources to begin again. But he is also aware of the road that lies ahead of him, the one without his country. He will be in exile for the foreseeable future. I was telling them about Paul's family scattered out around the world after World War II. His father didn't come back to Poland until 50 years later. About the Nazis here at Shehuv taking Stefan's grandparents to the concentration camps. About Bazia and Bogus' mother, who was arrested as an 18-year-old, tried and taken to Siberia. Her crime? She was Polish. And she lived in what is now the Ukraine. And the Russians wanted to cleanse the communities of Polish-speaking residents and populate the area with only Russians. Sound familiar? Paul tells me just this moment they are carting people off from Mirapol. Evil, the concept and the act. Paul's parents and their contemporaries, cousins, siblings, aunts, and uncles managed to create new lives. They resettled and had children, and their children have since had children, and so it goes. The generations beget the next. Zoya is walking outside. I can see her from my window. She should be walking out to her own home somewhere in Kharkiv. Max and Eager should be going to work there today. What's wrong with dreaming about buying your wife a nice piece of jewelry? What's wrong with planning a vacation or dreaming about an adventure? This question does have an answer, and it is nothing, nothing in the world is wrong with this. The weeds don't grow there. They grow elsewhere. They grow in the heart because they manifest in the mind to become an action. What are our actions? Mary Magdalene could not stop the crucifixion of Jesus, but she could anoint him with oil. She could not have prevented his death, but she did have the courage to walk with him to his end. In the last holy hour of his life, in the world of Gethsemane, the inevitability of his death could not be altered, but the love he felt in his heart was his own to express. There's not a saint, humanitarian, discipline, or mystic among us who has not experienced what St. John of the Cross describes as the dark night of the soul. In fact, we who are ordinary also experience these confrontations with the unconscious. John Sanford reminds us of what Young called the lifelong process that aims at fulfillment, the process of individuation in which the conscious mind and the unconscious mind are acting in unison and not in opposition to each other. The weeds grow here in the minds of those who are unconscious. And as painful as it is to accept that we are helpless against this phenomenon, we can fortify ourselves by observing our own actions, our own hearts, and following the precept of the Yoga Sutras a pad and jolly. First do no harm. Thank you so much. And I will continue reading next Monday. Please reach out with any questions, concerns, or you just want to chat. Thank you. I just wanted to share that in the show notes, I will be putting um, Amber and Paul's bios just for you to read about them and their backgrounds because they're both fascinating people and also the information if you would like to make a donation to their fund helping um, the Ukrainian people. Thank you. 
you so much for listening in today. If you want to learn more about the show, you can find us at interviewswithinnocence.com and on Facebook or Instagram at Interviews with Innocence. Please write me a message. Tell me what you liked and let me know what else you would like to hear. I would love to hear from you. And if you liked what you heard, please leave us an iTunes rating and review. It helps other listeners find the show. Thank you.